kama kwa mbeni. Um, I'm joining this meeting from the Bongani Mayosi Health Sciences Library at UCT. And I just want to welcome you all to the Western Cape um, uh, Higher Education Libraries um, webinar, lunchtime webinar. So yeah, we are here to talk about my favorite type of data, which is, uh, should I call it special data or rather special data? Um, you can refer to it sometimes as geometric data or geospatial data. So we will basically be talking about data that references the geographic location of um, particular uh, places and mostly um, providing geographical coordinates to physical objects and the like. Um, it's a type of data which is very visual and interesting to look at. And it also provides um, answers to a lot of um, life's problems like GIS data helps us to illuminate issues that are driven by geography and many issues are driven by geography. It also helps us to communicate, to perform and analyze and share information to solve complex problems around the world. So at UCT libraries, I know that the GIS lab is, um, it is used um, a lot also by um, our researchers in health sciences, particularly those who are studying epidemiology. So I'm here to introduce um, my colleagues, um, Thomas Slingsby and Nicholas Lindenberg, who are part of Digital Library Services at UCT Libraries. And they are here to talk to us about the GIS lab at UCT. So the GIS lab at UCT, its primary goal is to um, assist users to develop their GIS skills in order to perform sound data capture, geospatial analysis, and map production. So over to you, Thomas and Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the um, invitation to speak to you today. Um, my name is Thomas Slingsby. Um, I'll be assisted by my colleague, Nicholas Lindenberg, and together we are the UCT GIS lab falling inside UCT libraries. Um, so we've, I'm not quite sure how to pitch today's talk because we've never talked to, besides our own librarians, of course, we've never talked to an audience quite like this before. So please do feel free to um, ask questions in the chat or to interrupt if you have questions um, in a particular direction. Um, so firstly, let me speak about where we fall inside the university. So this is the sort of the, the research cycle or the whole university structure. And we're obviously inside UCT libraries um, and we fall within inside a department called Digital Library Services. Um, what does Digital Library Services do? Um, we do specialist digitization for digital preservation and online showcasing. So that's a lot of sort of data management side of things as well as data curation and research data management. Um, geographic information systems are slightly tacked on there, but we do have a, a, a lot in common when it comes to data handling techniques, et cetera. Um, and so that's why we fall inside um, DLS. Um, so I'm gonna cover three basic topics, the structure, I'm going to talk about what is GIS, what is spatial data, sometimes called spatial data, um, and talk about GIS support, what do we actually do. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about reference systems, just because that's a common term, even though they're not quite the same between libraries and uh, geospatial analysts. Um, and then I'm going to show a worked example, just um, to, to give you some idea of the kind of thing that a researcher might be doing. Um, and then afterwards, we're going to look at identifying the types of questions that might be GIS related that you might receive in libraries. So what is GIS? Um, it's geographic information systems. It's also sometimes called geographic information software or geographic information science. The system is the whole thing. The software is just the software. So without data and a project to do with it. You don't really have a geographic information system. You just have the soft software, which is where you need to get started. Um, but the GIS in terms of geographic information systems is the whole thing. 
And then geographic information science is kind of the academic study of geographic information systems. Um, so it's if you're actually studying these, not how to do it, but how to make it better, how to change methods, etc. Um, and a geographic information system is simply a system for working with spatial data. So how to visualize, how to analyze, um, and how to manage spatial data. Um, there are a lot of different types of systems. You can get them on your cell phone, you can get them on desktop, which is obviously more common, and then you get them in web platforms, so they're working in your browser. Um, I'm betting that almost everyone here has used a GIS before. If you've ever used Google Maps to, or something like Waze to navigate, you've used a GIS. If you've ever called an Uber, you've used a GIS. That's, it's GIS technology that finds you, finds the driver, matches you up together, and then gets you routed to your destination. Um, that's all geographic information system technology. Um, and then there's the big heavy side of things, which is servers for data processing and storage. And these are often linked to web platforms. So instead of having the software on your own desktop, you're operating through a web browser and all the heavy lifting is being done by a server somewhere else. Um, but very simply, it's an app for doing cool map stuff. Um, so it can be quite intimidating and it can be quite a learning curve, but it's not really that um, it a lot comes at you at once, but if you break it down into small chunks, it's not really that bad. Um, so what is spatial data? So this is a little bit um, maybe more from a library's point of view. Um, we get requests for data. So what, what is spatial data? Um, and spatial data is any data that has a locational component. So what we traditionally think of as coordinates, latitude, longitude are the more obvious ones, um, but a, a spreadsheet with a list of addresses. So that's also a spatial data layer. You have a reference to the earth's surface using people's addresses. Uh, similarly with place names or directions. Um, if you have a list of um, Woolworths and it tells you which suburb each Woolworths is in, in a table, that can become spatial data. You can symbolize by that. Um, spatial data is generally referred to as layers. So we'll talk about a GIS layer or a layer of data uh, or a data layer. And layers are kind of, so um, GIS and maps are very closely linked, obviously. And people think GIS, they think maps, but actually, with GIS, we talk about layers, and a map is constructed from layers. So it's almost the, the smallest publication unit in GIS is a spatial layer rather than a map. So um, on the left here, you can see examples like land parcels or zoning or topography, wetlands, demographics. Each one of these is a layer. Each one is an individual data item that someone might be looking for, and we would then um, compile those together in a specific order to answer a specific question. So. For example, if you wanted, here's a demographics layer and there's a land cover layer. If you wanted to know how many people lived inside each different land cover type, you could combine those two layers to answer that question. Um, there are quite a few different formats for the layers, but there's two basic types. These don't cover all spatial data, but they're probably 99% of spatial data. It either comes in a vector format, which is a discrete features such as houses, roads, rivers, river lines, Vector formats are simple points, lines, and polygons. Uh, points are connected together to make lines. Lines are connected together to make polygons. Um, and then the other data set is raster or con for continuous features. And this is a pixelated image, basically. So an image made up out of pixels. And each pixel will have a value, and that value will represent something. So um, we use this for continuous data, like something like sea surface temperature. Is Obviously, there's a temperature everywhere on the surface of the sea, so it's continuous. And if you divided that whole a picture of the sea up into each pixel and you could record the value of the temperature as the value of that pixel so that's a raster data set um, we often use it for things like elevation where the value of the pixel will be height above sea level um, or mean annual rainfall where the value in the pixel will be um, that value so vectors and rasters um, these are make up most special data So what do GIS support services do? Um, so um, the GIS lab has existed for quite a lot longer than it has been in inside UCT libraries. And our services are kind of defined by our users in terms of what they need. Um, but our main tasks are we run the GIS software license for, uh, for UCT, for ESRI, who are a big um, publisher in GIS in terms of software. Um, they also publish data, but mostly through their site license, we get to access everything, their software, their, their data, and their training, for, um, online training facilities. So we administer that. 
We also recommend, we're not the Esri GIS lab though. We do recommend open source platforms and also people just using coding environments. Um, then we can recommend training and give access to training as well. So it's all self-taught, self-learning stuff. But generally, if somebody comes to us with a, this is what I want to learn how to do, what we can do is we construct a, um, a training program for them. So saying you'll want to do this online course and this online course and maybe watch this YouTube video. And that should get you to roughly where you want to be to get started. Um, project planning, which is something that um, can be a bit of a contentious issue. A lot of people come to us after they've started their project and we, we plead with them, please to come to us at the beginning because we can check out your methods and we can spot problems before they happen. Um, quite often people come to us after the fact they've been into the field, they've collected all their data, now they want to do something. And you're like, wow, if you just collected this one extra piece of data while you've been doing that, everything would have been so much easier. Um, but we do project planning so people have a result that they want to get to work towards um, and then we'll we'll go about how the, how they should either collect data or the kind of GIS methods they should use to get there and that kind of thing. Um, and then a more library type function, which is actually finding spatial data. Um, people say, I need soils data for Malawi. And you're like, okay, so let's have a look. Um, most of the stuff is to be found online, but we, um, we have experience with finding it. So we We've got some pretty good ideas of which websites are nice ones, which ones are not so nice ones, who's published a good data set of this kind of thing. Thing like if you want rainfall for the globe, then you want to look at the chirps data set, that kind of thing. So it's not so much data holdings that we have ourselves, even though we do have quite a large data holding ourselves. These days it's far more about pointing people to the right place to download the data that they want, especially because a lot of this data is time sensitive. It just doesn't make a lot of sense for us to try and keep it all. Um, we're always going to be out of date. As soon as we've downloaded something, it, the next day, there might be a newer version on the website. So I'd rather just um, send people straight there. Then the biggest part of our job is probably GIS troubleshooting. It's not working. I did the thing. It was meant to do something. It didn't do the thing it was meant to do. Help, help. Um, nothing lines up. Um, <laughs> I've, I've done, I followed a rhinoceros around the Kruger National Park for two years and I brought my data set back home. And when I put it on the screen, it lands in the Atlantic Ocean, what's going on, that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's kind of the fun part of the job, really, I suppose, if you know the answers, if you don't know the answers, it can be very intimidating. Um, but uh, this is probably the biggest part of our job is GIS troubleshooting is help, helping people actually make it work. Um, and then spatial analysis methods is very similar to project planning in the sense that uh, it, it's, it's about coming up with a method. And then cartographic advice. We're always very cautious around cartographic stuff because we don't, we're not a map production house. We don't produce maps for people. We help people produce their own maps. So there will always be a case where we end up making a map for someone. And so sometimes we'll either ask for a credit and sometimes even an authorship if it's for a publication, but that's not really our goal and our function. There's only two of us. There's a lot of people at UCT who want maps. If we were a map production house, all we'd do would spend all day making maps um, and no one else would really learn anything. Um, so that's the support services that we do. Um, now I briefly want to talk about reference systems um, just because this is something we have in common with, with libraries. Um, we also have a lot of different reference systems. And when we talk about reference systems, we're talking about coordinate reference systems, but they're not dissimilar from a library reference system in that they tell us where things are um, and where they can be found. So there are two basic types of reference, reference systems. Um, so let's talk about what they are first. It's basically, so our catalog is space and our reference system is telling us what is at any certain location in space. So there are two different kinds of coordinate systems or two general kinds, geographic and projected. I'll discuss, discuss those in a moment. Um, it's all about location and what is at that location. And there's a lot of things at any one location, um, soil type, air temperature, uh, plant matter, uh, property value, um, uh, basic infrastructure, um, biodiversity, biome. These, these are all things at any one location, these are all things that would exist there. Um, and I mean, I've, I've hardly scratched the surface. Um, then we talk a lot about spatial relationships. So like when I spoke about layers before, a lot of what we do is comparing layers to each other, the relationships between two different um, feature types on the Earth's surface. Um, is something near something else? Is, it in, is something inside a lake boundary? Is it outside a lake boundary? Um, these are all sort of spatial relationships. The word topology comes up here quite a lot. Um, 
so it's about exploring those relationships between things in space and the bottom line is that everything happens somewhere so everything has a spatial relationship to everything else um, even a book it was written somewhere it was published somewhere it was acquired somewhere um, it is stored somewhere the everything has can be tied to space well everything on the planet and then the things off the planet can be tied to the other kind of space um, or outer space. So um, Tobler's law, which is the first law of geography, is everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things, um, which is, if you think about the world, it's kind of true. You're, you're not going to find a piece of um, aforementioned forest right next to a piece of desert. Like that would be, if the, if the world surface was random, you could go from being on a glacier to being in a river almost instantaneously, whereas actually the piece of land next to the piece of land you're standing on is probably quite similar to the piece that you're on. Um, it changes slowly, but it does change. Um, so, uh, if you don't like maths, just put your finger in the ears for a moment. We're not going to we're not going to be here long. Um, so, we talk about geographic coordinate systems. This is probably the most commonly recognised coordinate system. Most people know it as latitude and longitude, um, and it's degrees, minutes, seconds, or decimal degrees, and it's what we call a spherical coordinate system, meaning that it operates on a sphere and it's in, it's a way to pinpoint your location anywhere on a globe. Um, very nice for data interoperability or what that means is for sharing data. Everybody in the world knows about latitude and longitude. If you get give them data in lat long, they'll know what to do with it. If you receive data in lat long, you'll know what to do with it. So it's a very nice interchange format. It's, it's If you think of reference systems as languages, um, this is the, this is the common language, it's the universal language that, that almost any GIS person will speak. So it's very useful from that point of view. Um, where it's not useful is if I want to know a distance between two cities to tell you the distance in degrees, doesn't make a lot of sense, especially because degree is not a consistent unit. As you move from the poles to the equator, the length, you can see the length of the lines change, the distance that a degree covers, it changes. It's not a fixed scalar unit like a meter or a kilometer. Um, so when you're actually coming to the point of doing analysis with your spatial data, geographic is a lot less useful because you can't measure an area in degrees, minutes, seconds. You can't measure a distance in degrees, minutes, seconds. Well, you can, but the answer is, doesn't make a lot of sense and nobody's really going to know what you're talking, to, talking about. Um, and that's when we start to project and we talk about projected coordinates. And what projecting ba very basically means is taking a round globe and putting it on a flat surface, be it a piece of paper or a computer screen. Um, I think we'd all agree that that is the world right there, but we'd also all agree that that is the world right there. And they look very different. And the reason they look very different is that this is a projected data set. And the other one is this is actually what the world looks like. The world doesn't look like this at all. This is just the picture that we make up so that we can understand the world. Um, but anybody who's done geography at school or been in a classroom that had a map on the wall, this is what the world looks like. Um, with all its Makeda, this is a Makeda prediction, by the way, with everything that's wrong with the Makeda prediction too, but I'm not going to get into that. But as you can see on the right here, um, the globe will do 40 degrees west, 40 degrees north. We'll use latitude and longitude to pinpoint a position. And on a projected system, we'll use meters. Um, to, to pinpoint exactly the same point. So that's reference systems. Just to know that they exist, a lot of the queries that we get are around, my data doesn't line up and my data doesn't line up instantly means you, you've got two different data sets and they're in two different reference systems and you're not translating between them to make sure that they match each other. Um, so let's get away from that and let's talk about uh, the example um, that we've done. So this is just an example in spatial thinking, how to answer a question using um, spatial data. So in this example, what we're trying to do is find the relationship between um, Cape Town's population and its load shedding zone. So basically how many people um, reside in each load shedding zone. And so how many people are affected during any particular um, stage of load shedding or any particular load shedding block. Um, so the first thing we need is we need two layers. We need one that um, shows the load shedding areas for the city of Cape Town. Um, and that was pretty easy. We can download that from the city of Cape Town's open data portal. Um, it comes as a feature class or shapefile layer, which is a vector data set. Um, and Cape Town has got a very nice open data portal. Um, it's not always the most up to date, but it is probably one of the 
best in terms of South African cities, if I want to find out data about a city, it's probably on the Cape Town Open Data Portal. I believe that Durban has a similar system, um, but I haven't used it very much, so I'm not uh, not completely up to speed with that. Um, so the one layer we needed was the uh, the load shedding layers, and then the other layer we needed is the population. We need to know how many people there are in Cape Town, and that we've acquired from the national census, from SATSA, um, and obviously the 2011 census. So the first thing we do, get into tables, this is where the, the information system part of GIS comes into it, um, the database side of things. It's really just mostly flat file tables, so they're, they're kind of just a fancy spreadsheet, but what makes this special is that if you look at this image here, you can see each little polygon or shape has got a different um, color associated with it. That's the population of that area as a total number. Um, and each shape there has got an associated record with it. So there's the picture, but each feature in the picture is also a line in the database. So we can record all kinds of information about that feature. Um, so in this case, what we're interested in is we're interested in population, which is here, and we're interested in area so that we can calculate population density. Um, Patricia, can we mute? Um, I'm not sure. Um, and then, um, once we have population density, we can figure out how many people are inside the area of each um, uh, each load shedding area. So I've calculated population density per 100 square meters. That seems like a pretty odd number. Why did I choose 100 square meters? It's because I'm going to convert this um, vector data set into a raster data set. Um, and I'm going to make every pixel in the raster data set 100 square meters, so 10 by 10 meters. Um, and so what this number will end up being will be the value in that pixel that will represent the number of people in that pixel. Um, so it's a little bit complicated, but it's not too crazy. So I take my population, I divide it by my shape area to get people per 100 square meters, and then I convert from a vector or a feature data set to a raster data set, and I use this field. As what are the values of my pixels going to be? The values of my pixels are going to be people per 100 square meters. Um, and we can look at the result. So this is now a the, 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 the sort of yellow to brown scale layer is a um, raster data set. And we can see here that when I click on any particular pixel, I'll get the value in that pixel. That's the number of people in that little square area. And you can see from the jagged edges here that these shapes, are, it's not a smooth line anymore. It's, it's, a, it's a grid of little cells that are colored in one color or another. Um, and each grid cell has the number of people. So all I need to do now to find out how many people are in a um, load shedding area is to total up the values of all the pixels in that load shedding area. Um, so in order to do that, I use a tool called zonal statistics or statistics inside a zone. So my load shedding areas are my zones. Um, and what I want, the statistic type I want, although statistics is not really the proper word to use here, but the statistic type I want is sum. So inside the zone, sum the values of all the pixels and that will give me an answer that is because the values of all the pixels represent the people in that pixel if i sum them all together i'll get the total number of people inside a load jetting zone so um in this case i've got my sum here and these are people please ignore the decimal pieces of people i know it's a bit gross but we're, we're not going to worry about them too much um and then what we can do with this table is we can tie it back onto our load shedding um a feature class or shape file using a very simple table join, which is a very basic database move of saying, I have a primary key in this table and I have a primary key in that table, um, which in this case happens to be my block ID for my load shedding zones. And I can tie these two pieces of information back together and I can tie my sum uh, onto my load shedding zones. And then I can visualize. So I, after I've done that, I can create a little map. These are the load shedding zones. Sorry about the colors. I've tried to stick to the colors the city of Cape Town uses. So the choice is not mine. The choice is theirs. Um, and then you can see the total number of people in each zone has been um, labeled on top of that. Um, these areas here that don't have load shedding zones are not load shed by the city of Cape Town. They're load shed by ESCOM. So that's why they're not included. Um, and we can see that I think the highest one is, is it this area here down here is 300,000 people. Um, but there's a simpler way to find that out. Um, we can visualize in other ways. We don't just look at the map. So for example, here we've got a bar chart. 
here are the different zones and this is the total number of people in each zone and if i you can see here i've clicked on zone nine so i've clicked on this particular bar and it's selected that zone for me on the map as well it's highlighted it so i can click on obviously this is a screen grab so i can't do this live but in the gis system i could click on any one of these bars and it would then highlight which zone i was talking about so this is just another way to visualize the information that's been created here um so i've been moving pretty fast are there any questions at this point has anything happened in the chat or would anybody just like to ask Um, I see just one message in the chat. Um, Alison is saying, thanks for illustrating how GIS operates with such a timely example and for making it look quite easy. So there are no other questions in the chat. Cool. Thank you, Patricia. And thank you, Alison, as well. Um, yeah, we've discovered through giving these presentations that a worked example tends to be the best communicator. Um, it, it, and we try it. We, we do actually have one specifically with, with libraries in the city of Cape Town, but we've done it so many times that I don't want to risk anyone in this presentation having seen it before. But it's also about relating uh, libraries to population groups. Oh, well, not population groups, to, but to pop the population area that they serve. Um, so we're going to move on now to um, the types of queries that we can expect to get. And I don't know obviously we're quite even though we're all in libraries we're quite a diverse group of people group of people so who would get which questions depends really um if you're in any of the um stem style uh, areas you're much more likely to get so that's um science and engineering um those kind of uh, architecture planning that sort of thing um you're more likely to get gis type queries but also in the life sciences so um uh, zoology, botany, um, oceanography. Um, these are also places where GIS is used quite um, broadly. And then, of course, there's health science as well. Um, epidemiology is one, but also things like emergency response um, and uh, um, those kinds of um, areas. Uh, we've, we've done stuff with the School of Public Health at UCT as well. Um, things like uh, uh, trying to track uh, TB transmissions and where people are most likely to be exposed that kind of thing uh, also economics and commerce they want to know where the people with the money are so that they can <laughs> target them um, it's not always that simple but uh, that's kind of one of the things that they're interested in i mean um, if you have a um, a loyalty card for any shop it's very likely that the reason you have they've given you a loyalty card is because they want to track what you're buying and where you're buying it and then they're putting a lot of that information into a gis to figure out where they should be supplying certain kinds of goods and where other types of goods and maybe how they should set their prices. These things are very popular here and not so popular there. So maybe we can adjust the prices slightly. Um, so there is, a, there is a dark side to GIS, but just like any tool, that's what you use it for. Um, so let's talk about spatial data queries. We're going to talk about spatial data queries, software, some data types, training, and then obviously help. So spatial data queries are literally that i'm looking for information about something at a location i'm looking for deforestation in ghana i'm looking for cattle numbers in kzn um I'm, a lot of this is sort of government often government publication style um information not always but um in in uct libraries our office which we've never used thanks to COVID, is actually located next to the government publications library for the simple fact that there's often a lot of crossover with somebody coming to get data and then needing to use that data um the if you wanted census information in uct libraries you went to government publications um i need a map showing i need this kind of thing these are all um basic locational stuff uh, like i said cars per field vegetation health contours aerial photographs these are all um spatial data queries people are looking for it people often say i need a map of and it's very unlikely that the map that they need actually exists in the form that they need it in, which is one of the reasons why GIS is about spatial data layers, not about maps, because somebody needs a map of cow grazing patterns in um, the Northwest. That map doesn't necessarily exist in the perfect form that they wanted for their publication. You might find cow numbers and farm urban and um, grazing load layers. And then from that, you could then construct that map 
um, of cow grazing patterns in the Northwest, but it's very unlikely that that finished product that they're looking for is going to exist. There might be something very similar or something that's pretty good that'll get them started, but actually what they need is the data layers to actually construct the map themselves or with some help. Um, then some typical queries that we get, so um, are about software. I need software, I've got this data, how do I look at it? At UCT, we're fortunate enough to have a site license. So with using the site license, we have access to um, ESRI software, um, uh, which is commonly known as ArcGIS. It's, so ESRI is the publisher, ArcGIS is the suite. So um, if you think of Microsoft and Office, so Microsoft is the publisher, Office is the suite, and then inside the suite, you'll have different tools like ArcMap and ArcCatalog. Um, then there's open source software. Um, QGIS is a very common open source um, program, um, which we, we highly recommend. It's very powerful. It's free, which is great. It also works on Macintosh computers, which the ESRI stuff doesn't. So if someone's using a Mac, we'll recommend that as well. Um, if you want to get started with GIS and just play around and you don't want to spend any money, then QGIS is a very good place to start. Um, it's, it's free and there's a lot of um, um, online support for it in terms of YouTube videos and tutorial websites, that kind of stuff. Um, it's probably the biggest open source project as far as GIS is concerned. Um, then for us in Africa, there's ESRI's Africa Geoportal um, specifically, which is all about um, African data being published um, for access. And also the Geoportal gives you some basic web GIS functionality as well. So um, as a person living in Africa, you can get a free account and that'll give you um, access to the data that's um, available up there as well as um, some basic analysis tools. Um, then there's some other basic tools like um, Google Earth Engine, which is not open source as such, but it is free to use, particularly for um, in academia. Um, it is probably the biggest geospatial library accessible from one place. So they have 40 petabytes of what we call um, Earth observation data or what's more commonly known as satellite data that's been formatted um, um, into easy to use, nice, easy to access data layers. Um, what's a little bit intimidating about it is that you do have to code in a Java environment to actually access it, which looks intimidating as, as anything. But um, once you've done a little bit of coding, it's all really just copy and paste. Um, coding was way ahead of everyone else on the open idea. In fact, the open idea sort of comes from coding. And the idea of open source is that you, you don't have to write the code if it's already been written. Um, so you can just copy and paste code, which makes it much easier. Like people look at some of the code I've written and they're like, wow, this is amazing, you're a genius. And I'm like, that block was copied and pasted and I changed two things it, and then this block was copied and pasted and I changed two things in it. Um, it's very easy to look like some kind of Poindexter when actually you're just barely scratching the surface. Um, and then of course there are the actual coding environments. So at the universities, Python is quite a common one and also R is another very common one. So this is, we don't support either of those directly so if someone is having trouble with their code, we can help them look at it. But generally what we can help them with is the geospatial aspects of their code. Like you're using the wrong reference system or um, you should be using a raster data set, not a vector data set. The actual, if there's something wrong with their code themselves, then they're gonna need to talk to someone else um, for help with that. So that's uh, GIS software. Um, then we've talked a little bit about recognizing um, the formats, I've talked a bit about this already, um, but there, there are actual um, file extensions that go along with these formats. So uh, vector data uh, very, very commonly comes in something called a shape file, which is a very old format. Um, we're not mad about it, but it's still sort of the most common format out there. It's still the most commonly recognized, the most commonly used. Um, one of the most annoying things about a shape file is that it, um, is actually not a single file. It can be anywhere between three and seven or eight or nine different files. So if you look at it on your hard drive in a folder, um, it and so they're very easy to break because one of those nine files is a .shp file and somebody says, I need a shape file of this. And then someone else sends them the .shp file, but that file by itself is not a shape file. It's just part of the shape file. And at that point, the layer is broken and doesn't work anymore. So moving shape files is also very annoying. 
Um, another com very common format is KML or Keyhole Markup Language. And this is the spatial data format created by Google Earth or by Google for use in Google Earth. So it's quite common. It can be opened up in Google Earth and viewed there. Um, then DWG and DXF are, are actually CAD formats. Um, they're not really GIS formats, but they can be open in a GIS. Um, the CAD formats are getting more complicated, more complex and more powerful, but they tend to just be the picture rather than the information behind the picture. Um, so we're not mad about them. Um, another format that I haven't listed here is something called GeoJSON, which is becoming, um, which by quite a lot of people is, is um, recommended as a preservation format. We don't really have a good preservation format for, for geospatial data yet. Um, we're getting there, but like for, for thesis, for example, a lot of people rec recommend PDF or PDFA. For geospatial data, we, it's not that clear cut just yet. Um, the way we're preserving most of it is to publish it to web services online and then they get served. So they're being served from redundant servers, which will update the format as it needs to be updated. It's not really true preservation, but it's kind of how you can keep a layer going. Um, then with the raster formats, we have uh, TIFF and JPEG are the most, probably the most, two of the most common ones. There's lots of others as well. Things like PNGs will work. They're not ideal. Um, and then there's also all kinds of specific formats for specific pieces of software. You'll often see a .img, which just means it's an image and it's only going to be recognized by the piece of software that made it. Anything else that wants a .img, it might not actually be the same file format. It's just another kind of image. Um, but generally, when we disseminate data, there'll be TIFF or JPEG for, for rasters. Um, there are also some proprietary formats, but you need to have software that you bought and paid for in order to make those formats. Um, then recognizing if someone needs training. So there's lots of training available. Um, so I'll start at the top. This is sort of the most formal is um, at UCT, you can, you can do something through the geomatics department. You can actually do an academic course. Um, for somebody who wants to work on a project, I wouldn't recommend this is the best route to go. You're going to do six to 12 months of training in all things GIS. And while you'll be a lot more familiar with the services and things, it's pr probably not going to be very specific to the actual project that you're trying to do. Um, then, of course, there's textbooks. So these tend to be in the 910.285 or the 526.286 ranges. Um, and textbooks are also great, but they go out of date really fast. It's quite a fast moving technology. So if your textbook's more than three or four years old, concepts will still be true, but how you use them in the software might well have changed. So um, textbooks, again, are good for, for, for basic study, but online resources are probably better in terms of, of how current they are. Um, then our, at UCT, our site license gives us access to something called the ESRI Training Academy, where people can do um, online courses, very like Udemy or LinkedIn Learning or that kind of thing. Um, they are uh, accredited courses, so they, they get a little certificate saying that they've done the course. So it's nice for our students as well to be able to put that in their CV. Often GIS isn't a formal part of the course they're in. And then if they apply for a job later and somebody says, do you have GIS skills? They can show their little certificate saying, I've done these online courses. Um, so it's, it's got that nice sort of formal aspect to it as well. Um, ESRI also uh, provides a lot of free training. They have um, quite a lot of MOOCs. They have six or seven. Um, Nick can maybe correct me, but they, they run six, seven, maybe eight MOOCs a year that, um, on cycles. Um, they're six weeks a piece, and they, they really are um, worth doing if you're into GIS. I probably wouldn't start with a MOOC. Um, it's probably you'd, you'd want to do some or the more basic stuff first, and then get a jump into one of the MOOCs when you're feeling a little more confident. Um, they also have a site called learnarcgis.com, which is a lot of worked examples, which are really nice. Like often a student will come to us and say, I wanna do something with this. And you go to learnarcgis.com and you find a very similar project. And it's a little bit like a practical literature review, if that makes any kind of sense. Like do this worked example. It's not exactly what you wanna do, but it's doing a lot of the things that you're gonna to need to do. And you're gonna familiarize yourself with them. Um, then there's QGISTutorials.com, which is a very nice open source website for using QGIS. Um, it's got things like, how do I make a map? <laughs> how do I do this? How do I do that? So for somebody who just wants to get started very easily, that's got a lot of nice links to it. Um, and like, it'll take you very specifically to the thing that you want to do rather than doing a whole academic course and finding out three months in that actually this is not going to cover the part that I'm interested in. Um, and then there's YouTube and on YouTube, you've just got to search GIS or how do I this? And there's there's a plethora of information up there. 
Um, and then there's also the firm, formal online learning platforms like Udemy, LinkedIn Learning. Um, I think it's smarter as well. So there is there's stuff out there um, for for learning how to do GIS. And then lastly, there's the troubleshooting or the help aspect, which is things like um, I can't open this file. How do I open this file? Somebody sent me the data that I need, but I, it's just a block on my flash drive or in my cloud storage, and I don't know how to actually get into it um, to see what's there. Um, there's a format, a fairly new format at the moment called NetCDF, which is a kind of a raster hybrid in the sense that it's spatial data through time. So it'll be um, lots of rasters stacked on top of each other, each raster representing a time period. And I mean, we've had a student, just an example, we had a student come to us and he needed the temperature of a very small area of somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa between 11 o'clock at night and two o'clock the next morning. And he had this data set and he knew that the data was in here, but he couldn't access it. When we finally managed to get the data set open, what he had was the temperature for every hour of the planet for the last hundred years for the entire world. So he had gigabytes and gigabytes of data and all he needed was to get three numbers out of it. Um, we managed to do it. We were quite impressed. Nick managed to do it. I won't take the credit. Nick managed to do it. And we were very impressed with ourselves for doing it. But this is a sign of you find the data that you need, but you still actually have to extract the data that you need from the data that you've acquired um, and how to, how to go about doing that. Um, so that's just an example of I've got, GIS data, what do I do with it? Um, the next thing is broken and corrupted files. Like I said before, shape files are not just the .shp file. So quite often people say, I've got the shape file, but it's not working. And then you go and you look at it and like, oh, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but you don't have the shape file. You need to go back to the person you got this from and get the rest. Um, a, a lot of GIS data doesn't travel well. It's often like a cluster of files, like a TIFF, for example, will often move with another little XML file that's telling you where on the surface of the planet this TIFF actually exists. And if you just give someone the TIFF and not the little XML file, it's not going to land in the right place when they when they add it into their GIS. It's just going to be a picture. It's no longer a piece of spatial data. Um, and then there's the classic, and I would say that this is probably 40 to 50% of the queries I get is my data doesn't line up. Things aren't matching up properly. Things aren't in the right place. Help. Um, and this has got to do with coordinate reference systems, making sure that your data is defined by the correct coordinate reference system. One of the ways I describe it is a bit like languages. If you get a piece of text in Japanese and you want to translate it into English, then in Google Translate or whichever translating software or person you're using, you need to know what language you're coming from and what language you're going to. You can't just say, I want to take this piece of text and make it English. You need to know what language that piece of text was to start with. Um, and it's, it's the same with coordinate reference systems. If people get a piece of data in a reference system, they don't want to use, they want to use it in a different reference system. You still have to define the original one and say, okay, this is what it was and this is what it will become. Um, so that's reference systems. Um, and then very lastly, this is us. So um, we are available on email at uct-gis.uct.ac.za. The slight is slightly old. The phone number is not currently working. Um, post Pre-post COVID moving offices, all kinds of things. Basically the phone number works, but we're not anywhere near the telephone to answer it. Um, so the email is our preferred uh, form of contact. And then also our website where you can find out more about us um, from there. Um, we do have a virtual service where UCT researchers can book an appointment with us um, and then we can uh, uh, have a session with a student from there. Um, so in fact, that's proved to be very, very uh, useful and it's probably going to change the way we work moving forward, even in a post-COVID um, era. In the past, students would come to our office with their flash drive or their laptop and we would help sort of do over-the-shoulder help. Um, these days, it's actually much simpler to just jump on a Teams call. They can instantly share their screen. They don't have to move anything um, in terms of data. They don't have to copy it or anything like that. They don't risk breaking anything. They can just call us from their desktop, screen share. We can have a look. We can have a consultation with them, um, uh, help them out, and then instantly move on to the next student without having to do sort of any of the prep work in between. So for us, it's been kind of revelationary. This, um, uh, using uh, Teams or Zoom to do this kind of thing. Um, and then these are the things that we assist with, as I mentioned before, training, software, um, 
planning data collection or project planning, uh, troubleshooting, spatial analysis, and cartographic design. Um, and that's what I've got. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Otherwise, thank you very much. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed the session. Thank you, Thomas. Um, there are no questions that I'm seeing at the moment, um, except for a few comments. Ingrid um, was commenting on GIS and she says it's an important part of digital humanities as well. And then um, Nicholas um, in the background was also giving us links to some of the information that you've shared. He has shared a link to a Google Earth equivalent, um, which is offered by the United Nations. Yeah, so I don't know, we can open up the floor to any questions, if there are any at the moment. So, um, so I, I saw in. I see Ingrid's question, what are the favorite sites for GIS? So for specifically for the University of Cape Town, the, the Cape Town Open Data Portal is probably our first port of call for almost anyone who, who comes to us with a query. Um, obviously that needs to be for people working inside the city, but most of our, our students, if not researchers are. Um, and then um, there's, a, there's something called the Esri Living Atlas, which is actually a streaming site rather than a, um, than a website. So it's, you don't go to a website and browse, you actually just open up your GIS and you go and you search, I'm looking for this kind of data and the Living Atlas might be serving it, which is pretty nice. Um, UNEPGRID is, I'm just reading the names that next down here, UNEPGRID may be one of his favorites, maybe not mine. Um, there's, there's a lovely website called Natural Earth where you can get all kinds of GIS data downloaded from there, um, all kinds of vector data sets. Um, there's another one called um, I, I only know the acronym, I'm afraid. I don't actually know the full name, but it's the GADM or GADM. And what the GADM is very useful for is it's the um, authoritative boundaries for every country in the world, but not only the country boundaries, also the province boundaries, and then the district boundaries, and then the news. I think it goes down five levels. So if you want, if you're looking for a particular county or something in India or somewhere like that, you'll find it on the GADM. So it's, it's a very useful data set. Um, particularly for um, political political boundaries. Um, it is obviously slightly controversial in those parts of the world where the boundaries are slightly controversial. Um, places like where India, China, and um, Pakistan meet, There's, depending on which country you're in, the boundary is quite different. Um, but it is a very cool resource and it's, it's very nice. You can build countries out of it. So you can select all the, the counties in a, in a country and then select out the country, that kind of thing. So the Gellum is quite nice. Um, there are others, things like Wilklim. Um, oh, there's the David Rumsey map collection, which, which Nick has just linked, which is very fun as well. Um, and those can be streamed into your GIS as well. So they're historical maps. Um, they're not always that accurate just because back in the day, people weren't that sure what shape the world was. Um, but they're still, they can still be very fun. Um, some of them, I think, overlay on Google Earth as well. So you can make Google Earth look old. Um, so yeah, there's a few. Um, it also depends on, on exactly the data that you're looking for. Okay. Um, thank you so much, uh, Thomas and Nicholas in the background uh, for agreeing to share all your knowledge with us. And thanks for breaking it down to a language that we can all understand. I think cloud shading is a universal language for all of us now. So you caught my attention there when you mentioned it. And also thanks for breaking it down to a language that the librarians can understand. I think another universal language for us as librarians is user queries. How do I get or where do I get information on this? So thank you so much. This was very helpful. And I think given the comments that we have received in the chats, um, the, um, everyone present in the meeting also agrees that it was helpful. So um, I don't see any other questions um, in the chat. So I'm happy to close this session and thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, bye-bye.